safe to say that, uh, uh, that Michael's portrait paintings are the most well-known aspect of his work, and that's perhaps inevitable. Um, but his work does exist within a much wider range of other medium, and um, I think it'd be interesting to talk about those first of all. Uh, specifically, I thought we'd start off by talking about hair. Um, I first came across Michael's work in 2003 when he was uh, included in New Contemporaries. Uh, but I saw his work uh, prior to the actual show. I was fortunate to have a preview. Uh, someone sent me some JPEGs of the work, and uh, this was just of the paintings, and they were completely out of context. I wasn't quite sure what they were. Um, they were quite odd paintings, uh, realist, classical, quite traditional. But there was something quite strange about them too, something compelling about them. And you knew that something was going on. You didn't know quite what it was, but you knew there was something going on. And uh, I just, you know, I felt strong enough that I had to kind of know more about this to not even wait for a new contemporary site. So uh, got in touch with Michael, went to see him in Glasgow. Um, <clears throat> and I was fortunate that uh, at the time he actually had a solo show on at the uh, a gallery there called Transmission. And the show was called Are You Hung Up? Which I went to see prior to meeting him. And in that exhibition... Oh, it's it's is it where you Yeah, come up to the studio. All right. Yeah, three days before the opening. And it's really? close. And then, unbeknown to me, you went back to see the show, you didn't tell me. So I don't know. Okay. Anyway, so I went to see the show. <laughs> uh, and that's where I kind of first uh, encountered the range and the diversity of the other media that Michael works with. Um, I guess you could say that they're all, all the media that he's involved with are kind of uh, concerned with communication, recording, storage information, uh, broadcast media. And in this exhibition there were a uh, sort of large MDF panel on the wall which had a, a large abstract blob on it of grey material which turned out to be ferric oxide and urethane, uh, which is the, uh, the core material for making audio and video tape and various other things, but one thing I do remember very specifically was there was a plinth in the middle of the exhibition that uh, eye height, quite narrow, and on top of the plinth uh, was a triangle of ginger hair, um, and the title of the work was uh, The First Girl I Ever Slept With. And subsequent to that, I know that Michael has used hair in other forms and in different ways in his work, but I just thought, it would be interesting for you to talk about how hair for you is a, a useful medium to work with. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, if you can't hear me, just say, okay, I'll try and speak up. Um, so, hair. Uh, hair was basically, I was interested in this, how we recognise things that are others, if you like, other things that are external, how, we, how our bodies communicate with objects around about. So, it was that idea that hair used to be part of, part of me, you know? And it was basically how, when you cut it off and you put it there, and there's a relationship between these things. What is that relationship? Yeah, so it was basically things that were used to be part of the same organism, and um, whether the body recognises itself, as it were. That was, a, that was kind of the idea. Whether it does or not, I don't know. That's similar, similar ideas come up later on with the idea of motherhood and ch children and stuff like So, well I talk about the hair, how I actually started using it. Basically what I used to do is I used to get hair and I collected other people's hair, but it was just, but I used to cut it up and make, make paintings with it, make drawings with hair. It's like if you cut, if you chop it in a wee bits and you use glue, it kind of looks a bit like carpet or something, or it starts to look like, and I was making, but anyway I was making drawings with that. And the idea was, was it because it was, I was interested in the idea of painting, how, how your body reads painting, how the retina can understand painted surface. So by using hair, it was about the, it was trying to kind of bring in the idea of a sexual relationship with these things. Sexual so in what sense? Well, I just used sexual, <laughs> it was just, that was just a metaphor for how our bodies could, 
physical relationship. Was I the physicality was important? Right. The, the physicality was somehow connected to the physical or a physical relationship is a meaningful one. You know? So I was doing, I was making drawings of sound waves. I just got these sound waves. It was the sound of yes and the sound of no. I quite like to remake that actually. But basically, um, what I did, if you, I made like canvases of them. So sound wave is the word yes and the word no. Basically, the idea was is it was uh, just in the same way the sound. You know, you've got your ear drum, you've got the sound. And it's the same with hair, it became just involved in that whole issue of recognition, which was basically related to my ideas of painting. I mean, in the 18th century, for example, when they started doing poetry, they come up with this, they come up with this idea that, uh, in 18, I think it was Byron and Shelley and all that, Coleridge maybe, they come up with this idea that basically a poem is more meaningful if it's read aloud. So you could read the words, and that's one way of reading it, but if, you, if you've spoken, was somehow more meaningful. And the idea was is that um, something, something which was spoken I mean, was more physical because the way the inflection, the voice, and stuff like that was, was it had a physical relationship to the, to the content. So in the 18th century, that was the idea that the symbolic emerged. The idea that the idea that the body was a, was a meaningful, kind of like non-rational way of understanding the world. And I was always interested in the whole idea in relation to painting. Does that make sense? If it's, if it's overly theoretical or whatever, just let me know and I'll try and... But basically what that amounts to is I was, I was taking bits of hair and I was making drawings with them and they were out there. And I was just questioning whether I'm asking, I'm raising that issue about how do we know whether this... You know, because if you look at paint as a, as a material, it's quite a chemical. It's made certain things. But the idea is when you make a painting, it's somehow supposed to mean something, it's supposed to be accessible. So again, by using here, it's, it's a substitute for paint, or a kind of metaphor for what paint's supposed to be. That makes sense. Yeah, I think that's... But the hair, this hair, on the first website, with was, was a hair, is that correct? Well, the girl, no, yeah. well, well, the claim happened. Basically, well, I started doing these hair drawings, and so what I did is get other people's hair. This is going to sound really corny, but it is true. Is that basically I get other people's hair right and I bleach it and dye it the same colour as her hair. Because it will, because the girl that I slept with, the first person I slept with, um, basically she had this red hair, okay? Now, I've been looking a lot at Duchamp, the idea of the large, see, I don't know if you know this actually, I've never spoken about this in relation to that, but basically, um, Duchamp's large glass. Yeah. Um, there's that female fig leaf, you know that piece as well. I mean, but basically within the within the work of Duchamp, I'm quite interested in Duchamp, and within the, the work of that, there's this there's this there's always this idea of a sexual encounter, which is to me it goes through the work. I mean obviously Duchamp in terms of sexual kind of metaphors. So the lad class was there and I was already thinking of this idea of the first encounter with a the first sexual encounter. Um, yeah, and it's based on that. How, how meaningful is that as a physical experience? And I was trying to use that as a kind of as a symbol of how we how we understand paintings. So to was try to try to we try to paint try, basically try to say paintings are sexual experience in one kind of way. It's not really, but it's a physical one. You know, I have a physical relationship to the object that I'm looking at, and then you have a physical relationship and you, and you look at it. The consumption of painting is a physical experience. Mm. How meaningful is that? So basically, to get back to where I was at, I was getting this hair and I was dying it. I was dying it the colour of that hair. So I did these big drawings of sound waves. It was in the transmission actually. And then I went into the show and the girl who I was, who I first slept with, was there in the show. And, that, and it was like, I mean, I think I slept with her when I was 17 or something. And this was in my 20s. So basically, um, I didn't know she was there. And I says to her, I says to her, by the way, did you know that I dye all this hair because of you? And she said, oh, that's nice, and whatever, she said, whatever. And then, but then what happened was, 
a wee while later, she says, I've got a present for you, and she came back and she gave me a box for hair. <laughs> so I've still got it, and I still use it sometimes. But I always use it, I only ever use it twice. But one of those pieces was when that transmission show, I, lit I had literally a. I literally had a, had a basically um, a sh a, a, something hard here on a plinth. And so another piece which, um, <clears throat> to sort of jump forward a little bit to the future uh, from that time, um, was when you had uh, a big strand of your own hair. Yeah. And you'd been holding on to that for some time, or keeping it. Yeah. And there's two pieces which... Uh, Two pieces of work which feature that hair, um, but it's, it's works in a different way. It wasn't so much like about painting; it's more about the lines to be more like hair as being a kind of recording device or holding information. I mean, yeah, so okay. it's idea, idea that somehow the, 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 the it's still that idea that the hair's kind of part of used to be part of you, so you've got a relationship with that. Right. It's a physical one, but it's still the idea that the information <coughs> you need it. The information's in there because. Um, there was a quite a, uh, a an unusual thing that we did ended up doing together. We went to uh, the Nietzsche archive in Weimar, um, and originally I think you wanted to put some hard drives, put them in the garden or something, just leave them there. Is that right? Was that the original plan? Well, we photographed them on the table in the study. But did you, yeah, but did you really want to? I can't remember. Did you actually just leave them there for a while and come back and get them somehow? Well, the idea was to take these. It was the idea was just to infect an object by just taken somewhere so it's got history. So we basically took, took these hard drives and uh, took them to Nietzsche's house and we photographed them there. And then the idea was to, then to take them back and then make a sculpture out of them, just with the idea that they've been in this house. It's to kind of, so the object just become infected in some kind of way. Which also, you also filmed your hair as well on the table, so. Yeah. Well, that's right, because we did the film, we did the Super 8 as well, yeah. And then it also featured that hair featured in a um, film of you leaving home. Yeah, that was another one basically. Um, it was, was the same, same piece of hair. hair. Yeah. So, basically, it was I was leaving home, I was leaving my mum's, my mother's house. So I was moving, moving out of the house kind of thing. I filmed this hair, I did this, I did this hair that I used to have, this film, I filmed that. I made a film of the journey, with this hair and the journey and stuff. I have to describe it, but it's a very rough film in a way, and somebody's just, it's a, a transit van almost, and uh, if you're the passenger, and Michael's holding the hair in one hand, his ponytail, and filming it, <coughs> I think you see Mum actually in the background, in the beginning, there's waving, a part of there's a part waving of it, yeah. and that's yeah. it. But it's, like, it's this idea of a seminal event in your life, you know. Then, uh, this idea of a seminal event. Oh, that's right. No, and that we just kind of lead. Oh, sort of, my idea was to sort of lead on now to that idea of motherhood, and that yeah. and one of the first paintings I saw, which then all started to make sense. Well, let's just say it began to start to make sense rather than complete sense. Was um, the portrait um, of Vidal Sassoon's mother, right. um, which kind of has two kind of themes, which you have already touched on: motherhood and hair, as well. Right. Yeah. So if you could kind of expand on that idea of motherhood and yeah, well, this idea of just, um, I was interested in mothers because of the fact that it used to be the same organism. I was just interested in this as well, that mothers and offspring used to be the same, yeah, used to be the same organism, you know, it's that kind of idea. And then once they're separate, it's that idea of them being, they've got a relationship with a physical one, which is, which is in kind of, Each other, you know? And then does that connect back to the idea of actually making the, making the painting with some attachment to it? Aye, uh, it's just that idea of reading something which is how you read, how you understand the world in a lot of ways. So, you know, how, you get, how do you recognise? I mean, if, if you experience a space or you experience a colour, or it's like, how do you know, how, when does it become meaningful? Or, not even when does it become meaningful, but it's, well, it's, it's obviously meaningful. It's just, how, how do you read it? Talk about that physical relationship. Because it's not, I don't think it's not me. You know, if you look at painting, there's like the colours in it, that's, I think that's fair enough. I don't really feel like I need to question that or anything. 
But it's, just, it's an interesting question. We understand how we how we how we talk about that. Because there's a big history of pain in this truth. That's all. Uh, yeah. Definitely. And um, well, there's more to it, isn't there? Because like there was an interest in Vidal Sassoon as well, not just the not just his Oh moment. yeah, like Vidal Sassoon. Well, well, see, that's when I started becoming interested in politics because I mean, in the summer. I see. I'll tell you what it is. It's about relationships. That's the common thing. Relationships between me, you. Relationship between us and objects. Relationship between people's political relationships. It's just how things relate, which all come down for, from an interest in how we, how we get paint, how you paint. You know, because I've got to paint a painting, and then you've got to read that painting. But I'm, all, but I'm also not just painting something else. So immediately, you've got a triangulation. People looking at it, and it's just looking at those relationships and just seeing how it plays out, you know. But in order to look at that, I start to look at people, how people relate to each other physically, how we relate to objects physically, mm. how we relate to each other politically, how we relate to each other sexually, and so basically, all these things come into play. And you can start off looking at how you how you relate to a colour blue, and by a process of analogy, end up thinking about how we do so soon. It's quite a political guy, thought for the Israeli army, basically. Um, he's basically got the. He studied with us, he does some study for the uh, Center for the Study of Anti Semitism. So he's quite a political guy, and he's a really committed person. And it's just that whole process of it. Um, so because but he managed to cut through certain things, because, he's, because he was a, I was already interested in here, I was already interested in him, but also it was more to it than that as well, because there's a whole brand that he does this in. I'm really interested in the brand um, because the brand Vidal seem to be representing what a lot of artists aspire towards. There's a real kind of interesting relationship between style and modernity, which I thought was kind of he Vidal seem to me embodied my ideals as an artist to be dead modern, to be stylish, but to be committed politically and also to be to look good and you know that kind of thing. It was like a kind of whole thing there, and so. His mother, when I, as I was researching him, you know, I came across an image of his mother. So immediately I think, right, okay, that just ticked all the boxes for me at the time. I just thought, right, that talks about everything is implicit here somewhere. But maybe that's a problem. Maybe that, I don't know how successful that work was because maybe that was too implicit. You know, maybe there was the explicit enough to make it tickly what I was interested in. Well, it's only got more explicit when you actually paint it with Elsa. So. Yeah, so in a way, the two paintings are quite interesting because they. They, uh, um, there's the two different approaches that you take. Well, I guess there's one in the middle as well. But they, there's, you find images of the, of the subjects you want to paint. Yeah. In some instances, you approach them directly, and you photograph them, and then paint from those photographs. And in some instances, you find images of people who then become substitutes for the person who you want to paint. That, does that make sense? I mean, what's an example of that? Things, um, but so if I can't find an image, I'll just make it up anyway. Yeah. 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 So it's just if you like paint somebody, you can find an image of them, but if you can't find the image, then I'll maybe find an image of somebody else. And sometimes it'll be somebody relevant. Yeah, I won't just get I won't just get an anonymous model to stand and I'll get somebody else to do something. But in the case of Vidal Sassoon, you actually uh, met him and photographed him. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then I just thought you just use that as an example to talk about the construction of a painting. So then you take the photograph and then you just work directly from that. And it, there's never been any kind of desire or interest to kind of to paint from life. No, it's just people don't have time these days. <laughs> and that's it. You can't uh, pretty much, yeah, you can't really expect to turn around and ask somebody to spend days. Not that they will. I mean hey, somebody was somebody's up for it, I'm up for trying it for that. But it's, it's really kind just of convenience, really. I suppose in Glasgow as well, it gives you, if you're not going through that process, you have access to anything you want. It's convenient, but it's also, it also gives, it's given me the, lee, see the leeway to kind of take things from the public domain. Because um, that public domain is something that interests me as a general subject, as you know. But basically, um, yeah, to, to work from photographs, it gives you that option, you know. Because you can take things from certain contexts, which could be. Something in the context of something will interest you as well. But it's quite interesting to, to, to meet people. I mean, we'd also soon I spent, I mean, 
mean, when I was interested in Vidal Simpson, I was since I was about 25 or something, and I painted him when I was about 35. So I basically wanted to paint Vidal Simpson for 10 years, man. I was like choking, I was like, that was like my gig. I went, yes. Vidal <laughs> Simpson, yes, let's, let's go. Because it was the man, you know, it was the man behind the brand, and it was like the brand, and everything about it, it was just really good. So that's the process of actually creating those paintings, those two paintings, they were both called Seven Events. Um, they differed mainly in, the, uh, in their backgrounds, and the backgrounds are an important part of the painting. They're quite, they paint often abstract backgrounds, but it's about the colour, and we'll talk about that in a second, the palette of the backgrounds. But, um, but just the construction of those paintings, so you have the photograph. Oh, yeah, right. well, so, yeah, so I basically got a hold of him, go to his house, photograph him, and then work, in, work the painting in the studio. That's it, really. I mean, yeah, I can try, always try to get a hold of the people if I can, um, but you can't always get a hold of them, so then you have to work with what you've got. So there's a, you know, there's a very recognisable style to your paintings. You know, they are, you know, there's, there's nothing really like them. So they seem very, if you try to think of something that's like them, you think you, you're getting close and you actually look at what those things are, they're actually not like them at all. So it's obviously something, I wouldn't go I mean, they're quite unique, there's something very, uh, that's kind of the, the allure of them, I guess, that you get caught up in thinking you know what they are, and then you realise actually you're, you're looking at something um, which touched on many things, but is very specific. It's kind of very uncanny the way you do that, because they look very traditional, they look very mid-20th century, but they're very contemporary at the same time. I've wondered how specifically or how intentionally you developed that style when, you, when it began. And yeah. I don't, don't know, I don't know how, how to develop that style at all. I don't even feel like I've got a set of style because basically, when I, I mean, I'm not, I, was, I wasn't taught by one particular person, um, so I can't say well, I come from a certain kind of studio tradition or anything. Um, but neither do I work from life, so I can't say it's intuitive, right? Um, but what, well, there's only two things that, that, that really make me. I don't want to work. I don't want my work to refer too much to photography because I don't want the. I want the paintings to be about painting. I don't want it to be about photography, right? So if a painting looks too much like a photograph, I don't like it. You know, and the idea to try to. But what, what is the difference between a painting and a photograph? So you're thinking, right? Okay, um, okay. Paintings are kind of laboured over. They've got kind of layers of paint. There's more going on than just that surface thing. If you see, the thing is, you can tell people paint from photographs. They've got a relationship to photography. I don't, I'm trying to avoid that, you know. My relationship to photography is more to do with the public domain and stuff like that. So how do you actually avoid it in the technique of making the painting? Well, we've got the colour paints. So basically, I'll start off with a canvas and I'll go, right, how am I going to paint this? And I don't actually know. Uh, and it really, really does my mind. Every time I do a painting, it does my head in. I don't. It basically, I start painting and I go, right, what am I going to do now? And I really don't know what to do. But I know I don't want to do with the photograph I'm working from. And play on it quite often. I work from black and white photographs anyway, even though I'm doing colour paintings. So what I'll do is I'll look, look up a book from Gainsborough or something like that, and I'll go, right, okay, Gainsborough. You, you find, tend to think that most paintings have actually got a kind of colour system. So, for example, a Reynolds paints, he work from blue to yellow, and it's like a cool, cool versus warm and that. And so you go, right, okay, I'll use that. So I know, I know when I'm going to do this painting, it's based on that Reynolds painting. Blue and yellow, or look at that. That's a, that Gainsborough painting, which is basically orange versus purple. And so that's basically, so you're just basically working with systems of other people's work. There's no really. But that's what they all did. You know, even Gainsborough did that. Do you know what I mean? Gainsborough worked with other people's systems. And Giovanni Bellini worked with other people's systems. That's what it is. So I don't see what I'm doing is actually any different from anybody else. But I just don't happen to have a person standing in front of me because <coughs> we were talking about games with a painting earlier on and Joyce and, the, and basically she was talking about how this guy's how a lot of green in the colour of the skin. Mm. That's obviously not from life. But that's games where they're looking at all our paintings. Where they use this terra verde, it's called terra verde, it's called, where they use that green underpainting, which is a system. It's got nothing to do with reality. And that's what brings you back to the whole thing about here for me. With our, the idea of recognition. If everything's just system, if everything's just a system, where is it? Where is the where is the meaning in that? Where is it when you see a beautiful painting and it really captivates you? 
that's obviously part of a studio tradition. It's not, there's nothing, it's got to have a relationship to reality, it's got to have some kind of relationship yeah. to reality, but you don't know, it's such a complicated thing, and it's so kind of systematic and systematic, you know, it's kind of, it's a co codified. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a funny one. Bas so basically, the, the, what was the question? I think the question is basically, you know, how do you decide what the question is? No, it's more like, uh, how did that particular style of painting develop? Is it intentional? I mean, what, you know, how old are you when you were in college? It must have been quite anachronistic. Everyone else in Glasgow, right. you know, being, doing, you know, making something that's probably seen much more contemporary and seen much more related to other things that were happening in the contemporary art world. And oh. you were making these kind of, what, which might appear very traditional portraits. Yeah, well, I just, I was like just, well, just something else. Well, just through, through college, I was basically interested in portraits. Painting. I was always interested in painting. Well, I was interested in loads of stuff. But I never really presumed I was going to be painting because I seemed to be quite good at it at one point. Then A and A, I stopped painting altogether. And that was that's when I was in college. And at college, I was doing all stuff for this year. This is MA or BA. So be BA. Right. So I stopped painting for a year. And then, and then I thought, no, I don't buy a band and paint, so I have to go back to it. But by the time I got back to it, because I'd been making installation stuff, it, that's just when I started making paintings, painting shows, which are kind of installations. So my BA degree show was basically paintings, but I'd also made these other kinds of got, like got raw chicken skins. I'd stretch these raw chicken skins over the country, so it was like these big areas of chicken skin. And the reason I'd chosen chicken skin is because it gives you goosebumps. It looks like goosebumps. Funny enough, we were talking about gothic again as well. It was like I was trying to get this kind of gothic thing across with the goosebumps with chicken skin, plus versus paints of Humphrey Davy. So he's paints of Humphrey Davy. And Humphrey Davy is. Oh, he's a chemist. Humphrey Davy's a chemist, 18th century chemist. He used to hang out with the Lord Byron and all that. They always used to take bathroom gas together and stuff. Didn't he invent the Davy lamp? He invented the Davy lamp, yeah. And, yeah. Did that have any specific re uh, relevance from uh, Well, I come from a mining town, so that's how I was aware of it, because I, you know, I used to work in a mining bar, which was basically it was like the Davy lamp was, was all over the place, so that's how I knew about it. But when I found out more about it, so originally Davy for me was a class thing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But when I found out he was a chemist, and then I found out he used to hang about with me and Shelley or whatever, you know, it was basically it was all these kind of, but he became quite an interesting guy. More, more than just class, I realised that he was locked in this whole idea of aesthetics because it's part of that scene. You know? Um, I mean you're I mean you're very Glaswegian in a way, like you grew up in Glasgow and you went to do your BA there and your MA there. Um, you mentioned Humphrey Davis. I just wonder what else how else Glasgow has shaped you and given you your values and kind of drives. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not sure. I used to think, I think I'm changing a wee bit about that. I used to, I don't know, I'll let really me think. Um, Glasgow. Well, I think a strong peer thing in Glasgow. Glasgow's got quite a. Glasgow's a really small scene in Glasgow. You mean the art scene? Yeah, yeah. the art scene in Glasgow. You're either in it or you're not. There's no kind of like. But you're, you're, but, but, but you're actually in it and you're not there. That's kind of something you're quite unusual in that you see that whole thing develop. You were studios above the Modern Institute, next door to Lucy McKenzie. You kind of know everybody, everybody knows you. You've never really been part of it, but you're not outside it either. Well, some people are definitely outside. Well, no, 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 I actually took a big. I mean, basically, I was working in these studios. I was working in these studios, Wasp <coughs> Studios, and quite a lot of painters in Wasp Studios, right? And basically, I looked at the guy next door to me. And he was painting these weed boxes. What's a fish? What, like paint fishing boats in Scotland? Do you notice that? It's just no. But what his spouse taught me some of these guys. There's this thing, Scottish landscape tradition. It's a semi-abstract thing. You go and paint fishing boats. It's all very Scottish and chipped and stuff. And uh, I was taught these guys. I've got a lot of respect for it in a way. But basically, um, yeah, the guy next door to me had been doing it for like 20 years or something. I said, oh, no chance. I'm not doing that. So I realised I had to actually start engaging with the art scene in Glasgow. And this is when you're BA, MA, post? It's just after I'd left the BA. Right. So, I'd be about 25, 26. So I just, it wasn't a case. So what did I do? I just started trying to care more about what was going on in Glasgow. I started looking out, going to see shows and see what was going on in the field. But I still quite, I still knew I wanted to get portraiture in here. And 
because I felt as if post you couldn't use fit a poetry. You know, there's no way you could get a poetry out of the transmission gallery. There's no way. This, was, this wasn't possible then. And transmission gallery, for those who don't oh, know. Sorry, it's transmission gallery, that's an artist run uh, gallery in Glasgow. And it was, Which was very important, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, I mean, basically, it was the only gallery that can. Well, it was the tramway, and then you transmission. And really, at the time, there was only two contemporary art galleries in. Or you see the, the CCA, sorry, they like three. Three contemporary art galleries in, in Glasgow, only three. <coughs> there was only one that was artist led, it was a transmission. So it was the only place I had a chance of getting in by the connection contemporary art then. So, yeah, I just started caring about it. I started to see what can I offer? What, what's my contribution here? Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't a case of me trying to make change my work to fit in or anything like that. It was just a case of me actually. I feel as if I try to care enough to contribute, you know, try. It's, it's kind of, is that the same thing? I never know, because I, I mean, but it took me 10 years, it took me 10 years to get a show, like this show, the kind of show I wanted to do, and uh, to be able to do it in Glasgow. And then they, they liked it, so. This, they was, liked the show, it. this was the show at CCA. No, that's not a transmission show. transmission show. But they liked it because I, I, like, I cared enough about them to make it relevant to them. You know, I mean, I knew a new post could talk about contemporary issues, and I knew it was like an important art form. I just had to convince them. You know what I mean? But it took a while, but I didn't know anything. Um, but I did care. I had to care long before I had to, I had to care about doing that long before I actually did it. You know? Does that, that answer your question about relationship to Glasgow? Yeah. The other thing with Glasgow and the college that I was at is I was taught these boat painting Scottish art, uh, Scottish landscape painters up to the middle of my BA. And then after that, people like Julie Roberts come in, and the Eddie Stewart, these guys were teaching me. So the whole new generation of young artists were coming in quite conceptual. Yeah. So I was on the cusp. You know, I mean, I was, I was taught up to a point where these old fashioned guys who were writing the painting. And then I was taught my second half by the conceptual people who were writing the conceptual art and didn't care about painting. So I really feel as if my practice is a very, it's a product of the art school at a very particular time in the mid-90s. Yeah. And I feel very strongly that I'm, I mean, I wouldn't be making that work if it wasn't for these people. People who came just after me didn't get the benefit of the old guys who were painting the boats, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? And people who came before didn't get the benefit of the conceptual yeah. people, do you know what I mean? Because there was a very particular time. Even if you go to the art school now, there's very few people in the art school at the moment who are teaching traditional painting. You know, it's quite... It's kind of it's a thing. I was quite lucky in that regard. I feel well, either lucky or cursed, I don't know, depends on what you look at it. But they feel as if it was a product of that. Which I think is fine. Mm -hmm. There's something I just want to just go back to because there is off your, your work sometimes um, inaccurately we refer to as Gainsborough like, but Gainsborough has been a kind of important touchstone for you, but the work's not really Gainsborough like, it's like more like you said, they're using the palette. But you know, are there other things that attracted you to games besides his kind of colour system? Was it, I mean, is it more to the position he took up as opposed to the position that Reynolds held? No, it wasn't so much that. It was the games were to me it was just a, it was just a hook. I feel like it was just a way for me to articulate ideas of which I had between aesthetics and politics. Because I was into, well, but when I say politics, I mean big politics, but also mean small ones. I talk about relationships really, but the relationship between two people or between two countries. You know, it's like, you know, um, so Gainsborough to be represented. What interested me about Gainsborough was the fact that he was very, very, very chocolate boxy aesthetic, right? I mean, it's like the Impressionists, for example, like the Impressionists are really political, right? I mean, a lot of, a lot of Impressionist works are really political, you know, and it's like, just get over kids, doesn't people who get, see that, you know, in the fact that it's actually because, but I learned all that from watching open university programs, modern art, modernism, I don't know, it used to be years ago. But, um, I watched him for years, I'm the city and I was still at school. In, so what, what, in what sense do you mean politically? Um, well, literally, like, like Sue and all that, you know, we were all kind of, he was an anarchist. Yeah. You know? But he also, um, but the thing is about Gainsborough was the fact that, um, yeah, he was very chocolate boxy, so I loved, <coughs> I loved that about him, I loved the fact that he was like totally like establishment in a way. 
And I also like the fact that he, because, but he was also a suitable hook for me because at the end of the day he was just he was just outside the locus of people's interest in contemporary art at the time. You know what I mean? You know when you're looking for somebody who can articulate your ideas, yeah. you, you've got to find the right person in the right way or whatever. Games would have represented that in my practice. So, I mean, so basically, the, the interesting thing about interest in the games was the fact he's very aesthetic. I mean, I was talking about how he's, he's first loved his landscape, so he's very aesthetic. He was inter interested in beauty, in nature. But at the same time, he was obviously documenting a political class. He was basically. Um, well, it was like propaganda for the Within that class, class, there was interesting like, women of some notoriety, wasn't he? There was something there about kind of, not exactly, kind of progressive women, which you've also been interested in. Yeah. Mm. I think the first painting I was, which was in New Contemporary, was Lady Helen Cosgrove, was the Hazel first, Cosgrove, yes. Hazel Cosgrove, was the first judge appointed for suit three. Yeah. So these kind of progressive women, or women who, women who uh, were resistant fighters, or were in yeah. intelligence. Well, I think Manchester and women well, I'm interested in how other women are represented in the sense that um, I don't know what life drawn. I was taught these life drawn people. Um, life drawn is a certain way of looking at women. Like nudes, nudes, very nudes is kind of like beauty, but it's kind of like depoliticized or something. You know what I mean? So I was interested in the different in images of women which were not like that, but which still talked about the idea of beauty. But it was actually the idea of how beauty within painting becomes politicized. <coughs> Again, it was another kind of metaphor for painting. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't just, you know, although, you know, although I'm interested in Hazel Cosgrove, she's the first female judge in Scotland. She changed the rape law, so it no means no. Um, she's now head of the panel, sex offender or something. But basically, I was interested, I was interested in her, I seen her, but the reason I got interested in her because I saw her in the Sun. I saw a picture of her in the Sun newspaper. And that's when I first became interested in her, I wrote to her. But the piece itself, the painting I made of Hazel Codrow for Cosgrove was actually called the Titled Lover. And it was about the idea of having a sexual relationship with this woman. And not only that, but so it was like politics and sex, sex and politics, and basically that kind of stuff. Relationships. But also it was a tripartite painting, it was a triptych, and each part was more finished than the next. So it was about the painting process. So it was about the painting process, sex, politics, rape, power, all these things start to kind of play in. Plus I did also, I also <coughs> as a nod to 18th century painting because she had the wig on and all that. So just picked up again, it's one of these situations that was just, I pick subjects because it just happened to become, I could connect loads of ideas, you know, so they were quite loaded. I was going to say, if, if you were to try to attempt to uh, describe what the criteria were for the subjects, of your work, I mean, whether it's screen print or painting. <coughs> could, you, could you attempt that? Because it's yeah, so yeah. wide ranging, you know, the criteria for how you actually go about choosing the subject for the work. Uh, well, I'll just be interested, for example. Yeah, well, I'll be interested. Is there anything that ties it all to, you're not invested together, but some kind of a common criteria or value which they hold? I don't think there is because there's different emphasis all the time. You can never find something. I don't think you can find something that actually. I mean, suppose if it's like a beauty or something or something that's like essential, the essence of something that's in them all. I don't think so. It's just a matter of emphasis depending on what, what you have to articulate at the time. You know, uh, I've done a painting of Job Blue, uh, uh, Mirren Bradford, this woman called Mirren Bradford. She's a, she's the wife of the guy who was a co founder of the SES. The, the reason, so I was, I was actually interested in this guy called Jock Lewis, who was a founder of the SES. I got the book at the library. First thing I did was go, right, who was, who was, his, who was he going to write at the time? I just, you know, as soon as I found out the guy for the SES, I just wanted to know who he was shagging, basically. Right? So it's like, okay, found her, job done, found us women. And then as I researched about the woman, I found out that she really did his nothing. And that she really, she was basically, she was really kind of, she basically, she basically fucked the guy's head about, right, right? So I'd done a painting of her, and I just called it the bitch mess with his head. And then funnily enough, we showed it to the Chisholm Hill there, and then I got an email from that guy, from that woman's, that woman's son, 
and he said, sure enough, he said, like, yeah, he said she was quite a manipulative person and all that. It's unbelievable. So I've just been interested in the SES. You talk about the process of how they choose these yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it's a good example, right? So I was interested in SES because I was interested in politics, power, aggression, all that kind of stuff. Found a woman, found a guy who's founded that. So he was like emblematic of the whole project of the SES. But then instead of focusing on him, found out who he was shagging, researched about her, painted her, and then since then, her son's been in touch. So there's a circle there, which I really like. And it's just, that's the thing that I was interested in painting. When you talk about painting in relationship to media and stuff, it's the way paint circulate. You don't just sit there. You don't just sit there and gather dust or sit there and look good. That's, I never wanted paint to be like that. I want paint to be out there doing stuff. And that's kind of what's interesting about it. I think ink paint's a really dynamic thing. I think it's really, it should always, I, mean, I think it always has been. But some people just think paint is just meant to sit there and gather dust, basically. I mean, often the paintings are generated within a wider context of an exhibition. That's one of the key ways in which you work. I mean, they 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 are sometimes created in isolation, sometimes for an art fair or for a group show. But more often than not, they're created, you know, to, to be part of this much broader kind of configuration of, of works. So um, that being an important part, um, important part of the way you work. I guess this was part of it. Took a look at the Chisholm House show, the last show you did. Just talk about the beginning of that, how that, how you build that up into a, into a full-scale exhibition, the initial concepts and the research. Right. Okay. Well, the very, 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 very beginning of that show was because that originally was supposed to be in a show, Green Naftali, right? Now, the original show, the Green Naftali, was basically I was interested in the idea of Europe versus America, right? So that was the very, very, very beginning of it because. I already, I'd already get this idea that when I did a show, and if I did the show in New York, that, and I'd be being European, because I was aware of the fact that I was coming from a European paint tradition, right? And the whole thing, I don't know, I might have it wrong, I don't know, right? I don't know what I'm talking about really, but basically this idea that America, a lot of American, a lot of American paints are photography based. Whereas I was, trying, I was trying to avoid all that, I was trying to come from a European situation, I mean I was looking at Van Dyke and stuff like that, do you know what I mean? So I, I, I was aware of how do I want to, if I want to be a certain painter, that's it, so that was the kind of painter I wanted to be, I wanted to be like a European painter in America, right? That was, so that was the start of the thing. So, but then of course the other show, the other show never, never happened there, right? So basically what happened was, I was left with this idea of Columbia, I'd already come across this idea of the, because I was talking about the relationship between Europe and American painting, right? European American painting. I started looking at how the British Empire, Columbia, Columbia is a woman, right? And she's a symbolic figurehead, if you like, for the European, for the American occupied territories. So she's a product of the British Empire. So it was this idea, because I painted Lady Cosgrove, who changed the rape law years earlier, I was interested in this idea of how women somehow represented, this woman represented how somehow colonising something or kind of take over territory, right? So that's how I come up with the idea of Columbia. It just so happened to be that because Columbia, because of women, this mythical woman who represents America, is so prevalent there. All these corporations and all that Columbia. So that immediately gave me a, a hand on the fact that um, I could then, uh, basically I put me on the CBS, Columbia Broadcasting System, which is a media company, CBS, you can see more of the and stuff. That was the start, but the start, the very, 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 very start, right. was European Europe versus American, European versus American European. But eventually, just that eventually kind of turned into the CBS. So, so that was yeah. um, Without going through the whole show, I thought it would be good, you know, to at least yeah. talk about this as it's sitting there for the duration of this talk. So how, how did um, Alan Turing kind of get built into that exhibition? Alan Turing. Well, Alan Turing basically is a code breaker for the Second, the second World War. Um, he was basically, he cracked the code of this German cipher machine called Enigma. Anyway, so I was trying to place him in the context of the exit. That's screen printed, right? That's screen printed on a newsprint, which is then fly posted. Now, that whole process of fly posting posters originally came from the 60s protest posters. So 
which I studied at, which I looked at at college, but I was actually doing that in relation to patent because I was looking to see where patent lay within the public domain and what the role of patent was in a public space. So basically, yeah, so I'm off the topic here, but um, yes, so I screen printed on the newsprint onto the wall, and it just came, again, it was back to look at paintings. Because, but if you might, it was also the thing about women and how women, yeah, there's a whole kind of, I think there's a whole tradition of representing women as mysterious, which is a bit, it's a bit weird, you know. Um, but again, it's that thing about landscape, it's a relationship to that, to landscape as well. So, yeah, it's quite simple. Do, how do you understand painting? It's basically enigmatic painting itself, as a, as a substance, it's quite mysterious. And the whole aesthetic, aesthetic experience or the idea of perceiving beauty in art is quite a kind of mysterious thing. Well, there's something about truth also and the, the idea of the auth is it authenticity, but this recent series of painting of the Femme Fatale series about painting itself possibly lying to you. It's oh, yeah, yeah, because I mean, uh, oh, no, yeah, because I mean, it's a mysterious thing, but you don't know what it is. I mean, there's no, I mean, I'm not the kind of person who goes on. I don't know what it is, but I've got this blind faith. But I also, but you know what, I respect that. See, when I'm talking about when I was at college and these boat painters, guys, these Scottish landscape painters, right? They really respected paint and they believed in it. And they, they, when you do a painting, you go, it's like that swash work and stuff, like that. And they, they love it and they believe in it. And you can look at it, you can see something in it, you know? But, this, but they've not got a critical relationship to it, that's the difference. They don't critique that. They don't have a kind of, They don't have a critical distance. Um, so, in many ways, it's a blind faith in the substance, right? And I admire it. I'd respect it. And I kind of, I'm actually a bit jealous. I wish I could do that. But don't you have to go through that process at some point when you're in their heart of making a yeah. suspend your dis disbelief and kind of believe in it? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But I have to go through all of that to get to that point because I can't just have that blind faith. Otherwise, I'd be going right now. Do you know what I mean? If I had that blind faith in the I'd be able to And I'd be loving it. I remember you explained to me that how that can also kind of flip back in a, in a negative way on you, that you, you make a painting and you're, you suspend your disbelief and you believe you're making this thing and it's beautiful and it's working and it's, there's a lot of you know, truth in it. You go home and you come back in the morning and look at that painting and you think it's shit and it's yeah. basically this painting is lied to you. Yeah. So it's, that, so it's basically, I mean, that's the thing, it's about, with, for example, if you make a painting with hair, if you have something here, just go back to here, or a good painting, it's about how do you trust that relationship, right? So that's why Mitch is show sure there was Turing, he was code breaker for the war. I mean, that was information that was definitely designed not to be trusted, it was tightly hiding its real intent. So treachery, stuff like that, it was a big theme in the show. So it was a theme in the work, in the way, isn't it? Oh, it's totally, yeah. Which is basically, a, it's basically a bit my ambivalence towards my paintings. Because I make a painting, I, sometimes I like them, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I like the painting, I'm like, oh, like it's cringe. And so, but rather than focus on that lack of confidence, if you like, I've tried to kind of sublimate it into the work so that basically I can translate my own ambivalence towards my own work into a kind of critical environment which allows me to make it and to continue to make it. Do you know what I mean? Is it an ambivalence in a wider sense, you know, a political sense? I mean, the uh, kind of distrust when you are doing Oh, yeah, well, just well in, the, in, the, in the Just Neil show, I mean, I think there was a different subtext to that show, which was basically that I don't, I don't trust CBS. I mean, I don't trust CBS to represent the world on my behalf. Or I don't trust CBS to represent the world accurately to me. But it was also about how I'm an artist, so I'm, in many ways it's me versus CBS. I've got my patent, I see patent as a broadcast medium. So it's my, that's me versus them, that's what I mean. At least, at least I get to participate in culture, you know. And so I get, a, I get a chance to actually intervene. So, so there's definitely, yeah. to, to there's that. a sense in some of the paintings, the work that you've done there is a kind of commemoration of, through portraiture, of figures who wouldn't otherwise be recorded. Yeah. And obviously, Stuart Christie, the classic eight number of that is Paddy Joe Hill. Yep. I don't know if you can explain who he is from us. Some people know who he is, I guess, but... Um well, Paddy Joe Hill was one of the Birmingham Six. He was locked up for... Was it about six years? Or was that Robert Brown? But he was 
we've locked up for a long time, and he's one of the, um, basically what happened was he was innocent. So he now represents this organisation, he runs this organisation called Miscarriage of Justice Organisation, and we represent prisoners who are innocent. And they always look for publicity and stuff like that. So basically, the story that was he was going to paint, I'd painted this judge, and he had had a relationship with this judge, basically. I don't want to get, I don't want to get you going into that, but basically, Cut a long story short, I was paying him, and we, were, we gave it, we sold it to Channel 4. Or oh, did Channel 4 buy that? Yeah, it, was, it basically ended up in the, on, in the Channel 4 building, yeah. the, on the news floor. Yeah, so uh, basically... Outside the lift, where all these people who re possibly reported on it, or people who hadn't reported it knew about it, it was a very famous news story. I mean, he's there, kind of like, you know, in a way that, I guess, wouldn't, wouldn't normally commemorate it unless someone like you came along and uh, chose him as a subject. Yeah, well, so this idea to try to elevate that, and the thing is about to put that subject out there, um, to intervene in the culture in the wider sense. But the, this is the interesting thing about painting, because, because the paint's made to last, it's not going to go away overnight, so you know once you make a painting, something like that, it's out there in the world, it's not going to just go away. It's not like a newspaper where it's forgotten about tomorrow, or a TV programme where it's, you need to kind of go to the library to see it again, it's out and it's floating about and it's kind of solid. I like that, and we sold it to Channel 4. They put it on the editors, they put it right outside the commission the editor's office. And funnily enough, I don't know if it's getting to do with us, but you never know. But basically, 18 months later, we've done a programme with Mojo, which featured Paddy and all the rest of the people we were working with. And so, but that's the idea. Basically, it was, good, it was good just to do some paintings that helped somebody. You knew, knew straight away, but whether, the thing is, you knew whether, whether I wanted to paint or not, I knew it was helping somebody. See, that's basically flower paintings as the nearest I can get to pure aesthetics. Now I talk about this beauty, this idea of beauty, and how I always use metaphor for beauty, like women and all that, and then I don't just use any woman, I use traitors and bitches and all this kind of stuff to kind of mess with that idea, right? Of how beauty can somehow be, kind of betray your interests. Well, I can, so I might do these flower paintings, um, because I can't actually, have, I don't have the guts to make an abstract painting, so, or I can't do it, I can't. I can't go there, but the nearest I can get to it is to make flower paints. So that's what I do. Just, a, just another question from, from me, from someone else, perhaps. Um, but I, I, hearing you talk, I, I'm sort of in the back of my mind thinking of the internet and how you research things. Yeah. And in, and in all that I get from you, it distinguishes in the way the way you research things. It feels very one that was analog. Or we're going to books, we're going to libraries, we're going to copy and, and places. Um, Especially, and like, how, how, what's the relationship that you have with the internet? Do you, do you well, the, uh, the internet is very important to me. Yeah. I mean, but I think the internet actually reinforces. See, I've got this thing I told Carol once. Uh, uh, my dad used to read the newspaper. He used to take mages, right? Yeah. And I says to him, "What are you doing?" I says, "I can't take you so long." So it used to be like the sun or whatever, right? I'd read it in ten minutes, and he'd read it take about well, half an hour. And I'd be like, "What are you doing there?" And he says to me, "Well, I don't read the newspaper." He says, "I just read them between the lines." Right, so basically, it was that kind of thing about, no, you know, it was up to say, don't, don't ever trust it face value. So the internet was actually really important for that regard, where it's, it gives, it's just other ways of representing the world that aren't in the mainstream media, you know. They don't, CBS don't control the whole of the internet yet, you know. They probably will at some point, but uh, not right now. So I think that, the, so the internet is very important in that regard. They do a lot of stuff. I do look at the internet, a lot of stuff, but the thing is about it as well is you've got to get a hold of the... Sometimes you look for images which are kind of unique, or sometimes, sometimes you don't want to just take an image off of Google, because it's basically, you know, just for that, just sometimes for a very basic reason, you know, you want to make a move of an effort. Yeah. Is that question? Yeah. Uh, I was just, um, before you talked about the flowers, <laughs> which kind of wrecked my question, so we'll just ignore that for a second. I was wondering if, in a way, what you really are 
it's, it's a portrait. I mean, I was thinking with Gainsborough, portraits had never looked like that before, because the person was embedded in not just their own world, but in their relationship with them. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm continually amazed about how portraits are actually pretty, they're pretty cool things, you know? Um, I mean, it's a difference between you and the boat painter. Yeah. Yeah, that could never be portrait. It has to be landscape. It it's never been. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. it just, it's, when, when I was amazing with that woman for the SES. I mean, I painted the guy for the S. I mean, I, I looked at this guy for the SES, found, his guy, found the guy's wife, and then next I got this email from her son. It's basically, he's based in New York. He says, oh, that's my mum. And I said, oh, I'm very sorry, because it was called the bitch mess with his head. That was the name of the title. And he said, no, well, that's a good title. He says, because she is a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that's just, that, that's brilliant. You know what I mean? I just love that. It's just... That's what I like about how painting is just out there, it's doing stuff. You know, the Paddy Joe Hill painting. I mean, we painted him. It's not just that, see, it's how we got to Paddy Joe Hill. Paddy Joe Hill, we got to him because I painted somebody else. See, I painted, I painted this judge. And I may as well tell him, like, basically what happened was this judge, female, first female judge in Scotland, I wrote to her when I was still at college and asked her if I could paint her. She gave me photographs, I've done the painting, I showed the painting in the tramway, like from a degree show. Paddy Joe Hull saw, saw the painting in the degree show. He wanted to get, take the painting and, and so he could display it in Mojo, the Miscarriage of Justice Organization's office. And the reason he wanted that because his girlfriend's pal had been murdered by a drug addict and she had sent the guy down. So Paddy Joe Hull had a personal relationship to this. He sat in the trial with her. So then when he wanted to show it in Mojo, the Miscarriage of Justice Organization's office, I said, oh no, I can't do that. I says, She's agreed to do this. I'm not going to put it in this guy's justice organisation's office. And so that was when we caught the idea of painting him. So we painted him. And then, uh, yeah, we showed that in London. Channel 4 got it. It went up on Channel 4. So there was like a direct line between me painting Lady Cosgrove and Channel 4 headquarters with this painting in it. You know, which is a perfect place for it to be because we got, we got Paddy Hill down. They had a wee kind of party thing for their new acquisitions, so the next thing you know, Paddy Joe Howe was down in Channel 4 headquarters, banging his drum about his organisation. We gave we gave him a donation, he got like a third price, we split it through these kind of thing. And then, so uh, he was like, delighted, and he got to plug his stuff. So it's really like, it's quite good, I mean, because it's people, you know, it's people. It's, but that was, that was like, the one with the, the Job Lewis, that was just weird, because I mean, I just got that horrid book. I mean, I was in Mitchell Library in Glasgow, Scan a photocopy and a picture, and then they say I'm getting an email from some guy from New York. It's just quite amazing. And it's, it's not the first time, there's quite a, there's a few things like that. But uh, yeah, so there's definitely a relationships, there's relationships there, and networks, which I suppose is the internet, because I think that guy, I think that's the internet, because I think the guy from New York seen that painting on the internet. So that's that's an idea, that's, that's an example of how the internet and painting can kind of somehow talk to each other or something kind of way. Yeah. It's just something about painting, being able to show a person embedded in a, in a much bigger place in, in the world, politically, their relationships, the class, and painting is able to do that somehow, in a way. It's part of a, you know, a genre. Yeah. But you, what do you mean? You get, you get into something more specific than that. I just, I, I just, if I were to look at the history of portraiture, yeah. I'd get to 2010 and I'd put Michael Fuller in there. there right, right, but you know, there's something about the, the, the widening up of the possibility of portraiture. Oh, right, yeah, 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 because I, because it's not kind of like it's, good, it's not that kind of provincial thing. And not just physiognomy. It's it's oh, right, yeah, yeah, embedded right, yeah. in like their past and people around them. Yeah, because it's, it's it's mediated as well, yeah. I mean, I'm also I'm interested in how paint sits in most of the different media and how it's affected by it. I'm going to ask about the chewing. Um, in your explanation, I think you didn't finish the whole oh, slide, sorry, sorry. Um, which I think is quite relevant to probably why you chose to paint the chewing. Um, is that right? I mean, the fact, obviously, that um, he was gay. Yeah. Um, so, and so there's this idea of, 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 of another layer beneath the deception, the breaking of the code, and then also the double life that he led when he had to leave. Yeah. And that wasn't going to be my question. I've lost my question. I've just made a point. <laughs> but um, I, uh, my question was going to be um, I assume that you, you read about Turing and you get interested in Turing, and the, uh, actually you can't paint it. So you, you go and find an image, and that's that you then paint from. Yeah. Um, if you can't find that image, will you not do the painting? Do you think you need to 
find the image? No, because uh, if I can't find a paint, an image of Turing, I'll just take a photograph of him, paint him, and call it Turing. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's simple. I just don't, yeah. I don't think, it's like one of these things where you just think you don't let a thing. See, I say this to you, it's like we are, it's like we are life drawn. Mm -hmm. life drawn. But you know how you can be a slave to reality in a funny kind of way. When, you're, when people are paying, and make pain, say if you're in life drawn or something, you're paying person's paint, the person's toenails or something, you're a bit like, you know, you don't be a slave to the, the subject, you know, you can, it's a bit weird, it's a bit weird. It's a bit like that, but it's, yeah. um, you know, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't let the truth stop me, for example. I mean, if somebody, if I would have had a point to make about somebody, if, um, see, I would just either substitute somebody else and say it's them, which I do quite a lot. I mean, I do do that quite a lot. I've not got a problem with that at all. And in fact, I was actually curious about the, I've actually invented stories about people, backstories that didn't exist to people, stuff like that. Like I just did it in the Chisholm Hill show, I did a painting of um, the director, the Lockheed Martin. Well, I actually never did a painting of him, right? It was called, it was a piece and it was called Who's Shaggy Who at Lockheed Martin, right? <laughs> Lockheed Martin is a big, is a big um, like defence company, they made Polaris, the space shuttle. And it's all about these two women that are in the office, are in the, he's, he's shagging the two of them, right? And it's a wee bit of office scandal and stuff. I mean, that's completely made up. Um, yeah, that's fine. But he's an actual person. And I've actually had to, I've actually had consulted, well, not consulted, but I remember asking Carl if he could find me a lawyer to figure out whether payments could be libelous or not. Because I was quite, actually quite interested in the idea that, because if you want to pay, pay and say, for example, stories from a newspaper or a heat magazine or something like that, then you've got to watch because they, Potentially, it could be. It can be lifeless. <laughs> but you know. Um, I have a question. I was thinking a lot about you this summer because of the Murdoch scandal. Yeah. I was thinking about your Wendy Murdoch painting. Oh, right, yeah. 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 So, did you have some ideas about the whole Murdoch empire before you did that painting, or was it? I don't know, it's quite juicy though, but um, did I think about that, did I, did I have an angle on that? I mean, maybe you should describe the painting. Yeah, well basically I did a painting of Wendy Deng. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a good example of the one you're, thing you're talking about, because I did a painting of Wendy Deng, Rupert Murdoch's wife, right? But I couldn't find a picture of her that was appropriate, so I just, I just opened the sun and I got a page three model. And I've done that, and I've done completely with jugs and stuff, and tits and all that. And said that was, and I just said it was Wendy Deng, but I picked one that looked kind of similar. You know, it's like, it wasn't a complete one. But yeah. So that's a good, that's an example of that kind of thing, where I can't find the photograph, I'll just find something that just... But in that case, are you true to the photograph? Does it look like the, or do you it invent it from there? It, well, it looks kind of like the model, the page 3 model. But the thing is, it's got weird, but it's just, the problem with that painting is it's a bit photographic. I didn't like that painting then. I didn't like the way it looked. A lot of people liked it for the subject matter and stuff. But it was used as front fill flash. It was backlit. Which, which, which if you notice, they do the organ model because I've looked. But, yeah. <laughs> no, but it, it's basically... Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't a great photograph to work from. So I was a bit disappointed in that one. But are you interested in, in that, it, that the, you know, the similitude? That it looks like the person? Oh yeah, well I tried to get it to just kind of suggest that it could be. It didn't really look like it really, but, you know, I didn't want to do it wrong. Something, I mean, Lady Dane's with black hair, she looks bad. She looks kind of in the orc, oriental. I didn't want it to be, like, somebody with blonde hair, for example, European. So I did, uh, there was a kind of attempt to kind of try and fudge the issue, but... But I mean, but let's say you were to take, you doing a painting of Carl pretending he was somebody else. Yeah, would it look just like effects. Carl? Which I've done. No, I've done that. I've done a painting of Carl. I, I, see, I, see, I thought, I was looking at pictures of Mark Rothko and I went, actually, Carl looks a bit like Mark Rothko. <laughs> <laughs> so next thing you know, there you go. Hey, right, Carl, you fancy me doing that model? Next thing you know, he has Mark Rothko. He's in New York right now. <laughs> <laughs> you go there and see him. It's Mark Rothko. But do you think? You know? So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm a bit slow. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, in effect, you're not a portraitist because you're not actually trying to capture anything that's called for. I mean, well, that's what, that would be one. Yeah, I can see yeah. what you mean by that, right? I can see what you mean by that. I, I mean, they are quite the conceptual things. You're painting your vision. Yeah, and even the people I choose to paint, or 
some things are chosen for different reasons that have nothing to do with what they look like, jumping or anything like that. Or, you know, there's some things it's like, sometimes even, some things even words can even trigger things, you know. It's interesting, it's because it's also about truth and sort of how you understand things. When people look at that Rothko painting, they think it's Rothko, and that's good enough, really. Because it's not necessarily about is it really accurately Rothko or not, because people are believing it's Rothko, having I mean, exactly the same kind of relationship to that painting as if it was Rothko, a painting of him. So it's, that's, it's like Mike says, it's not being a slave, it's like it's about freedom, that's how I understand it. Not being a slave to this idea, it's got to always be about lightness and kind of accuracy. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, that's an important part of it, but it's, it's, it's a kind of escaping, escaping sometimes from the trap, I guess. But is it is it not like 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 the Gainsborough, the, the woman who's green and distorted? Yeah, but she's like more herself. You know what I mean? I mean, it's it's not oh, well, being well, true see, to reality, but well, it's getting thing. some other kind of. This is the thing. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question, isn't it? You know, how do you know? It's like a. Well, you believe it's very very believable. Well, that's, as a that's the thing. That's the thing. It's a believability of it. So this is why this is why I went to the H.E. archive, right? When we went. When you say. I've not got any Nietzsche yet, but one of, the, one of the things I'm really interested in Nietzsche for, for that very reason, is the fact that Nietzsche's interested in the efficacy of things. He's, a, he's, he's like a social Darwinist, right? He's into he's in the uh, Darwin, Darwinism, it's about the survival of the fittest. He's like that with concepts, and cultures, and everything. So, in other words, if I can convince you something's true, something's true, that's what it is. And if CBS can convince you something's true, then it's true. Do you know what I mean? So there's a direct relationship to CBS and Gainsborough in that regard. If Gainsborough can paint a really beautiful painting and convince you that that person's real, then it's real. You know? And so that's a sort of direct... You know, so Gainsborough is not a million miles away from Rupert Murdoch. You know? And that's kind of thing, which is all people should have understand that through me too, really. That's what I could go into that kind of thing. It's been really interesting to hear you talk about your choice of subject matters and painting, um, your techniques of painting. And the first work I saw of yours, which I really loved, was screen printed on newsprint and pasted onto the Carl's Gallery wall. And I found that really exciting and interesting. It's a little bit of odds, though, with what you're talking about in the terms of permanence of painting, European tradition. Um, yeah. Because it's so, uh, although it's permanent, in fact, it's slapped on a wall, it's in permanent, you can't take it with you, that Aye. that actual piece will probably get destroyed or painted yep. over or peeled off. How do you explain your choice to do that? Because I had to make that work in order to articulate my ideas about painting. So, I mean, if I had just, I could do loads of paintings and talk about them in terms of their permanence. And see, the thing is, painting is kept, it comes for us hundreds, hundreds of years of went into the making of paintings becoming really permanent things, you know? But, I mean, that's why I think there's a real power there. You know, if I can paint, if you can represent the world in a way, in a way that's important to you, you know it's not going to go anywhere fast. But in order for me to actually um, do that, or to, it's not that, in order for me to kind of talk about, to convince other people that that's what I'm doing, I have to make this other work to kind of, it's just about articulating the idea of it, do you know what I mean? So in order for, so that's why these, these, piece, these screen prints are based on 60s protest posters. But, the, the, but what I'm really talking about is the speed painting and how it's slow as opposed to being fast like these things. And also it talks about how because they're based in the sixties protest posters with the fly posts and we get intervening into the public domain. It's it's actually a place that's just a that's just a, a vehicle for me to locate painting in that in that critical place. You know what I mean? So I, that's why a lot of screen prints are about painting. There's quite often a lot of sculptures are as well. I mean everything that I do is about trying to figure out how to, how to keep continue how to paint. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes 